Our gospel lesson for this morning comes to us from the first chapter of the book of Luke, verses 68 to 79. Listen now to God's word. Zechariah said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for God has looked favorably upon God's people and redeemed them. God has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of God's servant, David. As God spoke through the mouth of of his holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus God has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered God's holy covenant, the oath that God swore to our ancestor Abraham to grant that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness before God all of our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. This is the word of our God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks and praise for your word to us. We pray that by your grace, you will equip us to draw near to you, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts will be acceptable to you. For you, God of praise, you are our rock, our redeemer, and our hope. It is in all of your holy names we pray. Amen. While driving to pick up my son from school last week, I heard an NPR story that I found to be a little surprising. The 2023 Grammy Awards will now include a new merit award entitled Best Song for Social Change. All right, so candidly, I was surprised to learn that this was a new category being celebrated by the Grammys for the first time because songs of social change have been a part of the history of music since always. Music has been a vehicle for liberation. Music has been a forum for naming injustice, decrying war, and calling people together to work for peace. Songs are evocative tools of transformation. They both unify and disrupt. They tell truths and allow others to tell truth together. Now, singer-songwriter Maimuna Youssef, who is also a member of the Academy and one who worked to establish this merit award, says this about songs. That a song that gives voice to the voiceless when it is like a wildfire you cannot stop. You can arrest the writer, but you cannot arrest the song. It's already out there. It's in the hearts of people. People will chant it. People will march with it. You can kill a revolutionary, but you cannot kill a revolution. Now, while I cannot be sure of the earliest song for social change ever recorded, and I'm pretty sure Google, Siri, Alexa have no clue either, I know that Luke's gospel contains many of them, even just in these first two chapters. From Mary's Magnificat 
to the proclamation of the angels singing words of praise, to the words I just read of the prophet Ze and priest Zechariah, father of John the Baptist, singing these words after nine months of silence. The birth narratives in Luke's gospel are filled with song after song after song of God's engagement in liberating change. These songs point out with awe God's initiative in the world, that God is a God of faithfulness, that God is a God who saves, that God is a God who releases captives from captivity. They notice that God does not only redeem spirits, but that God brings needed change to the fabric of society. That the one who will be born to Mary, in fact, will usher in reversals to the very social order. That he will fill hungry bellies and empty spirits. And that God in Christ will not only notice those who are disenfranchised, wounded, ignored, or oppressed, but that God will come to them, will embrace them, will love them as one of them. That God will experience in God's own self all that has held God's people back. And God will bring them peace. God is a God who gives something to sing about. Now, the gospel lesson I just read for today is actually presented in the lectionary as our song for the morning. It replaces our psalm for the day, and both times that it shows up in our lectionary cycle, it does just that. It is situated so that it is a song that we recognize and name and sing for the day. Through Zechariah's words, we hear a song of social change, a proclamation that God is a God who is on the move and making all things new. The Messiah of whom prophets have spoken is on his way. The God who has been faithful to God's people is fulfilling the hopes they have held for millennia. And his, Zechariah's own miraculous child, will be about the important work of pointing others to the revolutionary love of God and Jesus Christ. God's mercy will break into the world, bringing wisdom and life and peace. And the newborn son in Zechariah's arms as he sings, the child he blesses in song, has already been and will be a herald for the Prince of Peace. He will be the one who comes to prepare hearts and minds for the change that's about to come. Now there are some interesting details in Zechariah's song that modern readers of this text might miss. For while his words are not as pointed as the words that Mary sings in the Magnificat, Zechariah's song gives voice to the societal reversals that Jesus will bring. Reversals of fortune evident throughout all of the Gospel of Luke, where women are called as disciples, where foreigners are welcomed as family, where the outcasts are invited to join around a table, the unclean are embraced, the sinner forgiven, and where the rotten in which radical grace upends the societal norms that divide or diminish or distinguish one human from the next. One commentator remarks this, Zechariah's song is based on a hymn of the poor of the Lord. And since Zechariah and Elizabeth were among the Jewish upper class, he was a priest and she was a descendant of Aaron, his use of a song of the poor signals the reversals of fortune interpreters traditionally identify as central to the book of Luke. Zechariah has noticed that God is doing things differently. Now Zechariah, a priest for ages, comes from a long line of theological experts, and he is no different. 
He is a practiced professional guiding others as they worship and study the God of their ancestors, a God who has been faithful since the dawn of time. Zechariah is one who has access to the innermost chamber of the temple and has access to centuries worth of tradition, wisdom, and faith. But from the moment earlier on in Luke's gospel, when Zechariah balked at the angelic encounter, when he learned from that angel Gabriel that he and his wife would soon have a son, Zechariah has been forced to re-examine his status. Through a bit of a divine timeout, if you will, his voice, the voice of a leader, of a man, of a Jewish elite, was silenced by God in an instant. All that he took for granted about day-to-day -day life, about his own identity, and even about God was disrupted. Without a voice, Zechariah had to engage the world differently. First, he had to admit that he had messed up. He had to face the fact that in spite of his tremendous faith, he had put God in a box, limited his view of God's power and engagement in the world. He had to admit that God did not simply respond to priestly action in a temple, but that God would still be engaged in the world God had made in specific, tangible ways, fulfilling promises in surprising encounters as God did for Abraham and Sarah all those years ago. Without his voice, Zechariah had to take a turn in the passenger seat of life for a change. He had to make space for others to speak and be heard. And in Luke, we see that those who talk and sing and cry out, especially in these first two chapters, are those whose own voices have been silenced by the world. Zechariah had to listen. He had to notice God at work through those that he and others have often ignored. He had to pay attention to the new way that God was about to act in the world. In his season of silence, Zechariah learned not only that the God he worshiped and served is not a God of the status quo, but he also learned that God is not a God who sticks to the way things have always been or adhered to relegated rituals of habit. Rather, God is a God of surprise who upends societal norms and expectations and does a new thing for the good of all people. So when Zechariah's speech first returns to his body, he sings. He can't help himself. He sings praise to a God who is faithful and eternal, who is enacting a long-standing promise spoken through the prophets in a new way. He sings of a God who has not forgotten God's people even when circumstances of light might make one feel otherwise. He sings of a God who saves. He sings of a God who is at work upon an old man and his infant son. He sees a God and is in awe. Now today is Christ the King Sunday, the last Sunday of our liturgical year. Now this day bears a complicated label, but it affirms God's sovereign power. Yet, our texts and the entirety of scripture remind us over and over again that God's power, although above all other powers, God's power is not expressed through hierarchies or domination or force of position. Rather, God's sovereignty, God's power, shows up through the leveling of playing fields and an outpouring of gracious love. And so as we mark the end of one liturgical year and prepare for the next, 
We remember that we encounter the fullness of God's love for us in surprising ways. You know, in the flesh of a small baby that was born to an unwed young mom in a manger in Bethlehem. We will celebrate that God came to us in one who ate in the homes of tax collectors and sinners, who was anointed by the tears of women or sweet perfume from an alabaster jar. We will remember that God came to us in one who extended forgiveness of all sins, who fed thousands and who raised the dead to life. We remember the one who, although God hung on a cross alongside criminals, who suffered and died, but who three days later greeted women outside of an empty tomb and disciples through locked doors. The God of whom Zechariah sings, the God of whom we sing today, is a God at work, no, not only in yesterday's stories, but in today's world. This is a God who challenges our assumptions, who disrupts our status quo, reverse, reverses authorities in governments and churches, and invites us to do things that we thought were impossible. Like Zechariah, we might need to take a minute to be, or, or nine months to be quiet, <laughs> that we might hear the voices of others and make space for those who have been on the margins, that they might take the lead. We might need to let go of what was in order to create room for what's new and what is to come, even if that means letting go of a piece of our own identity or security or comfort or familiarity. We might need to pay attention to what is going on in the world around us with fresh eyes and see maybe for the first time the faces of those we pass on the sidewalk or a company through a grocery line are those through whom God is at work too. As I reflected on the song of Zechariah and heard the words he sung to his infant son, I couldn't help but remember the first song that I sung to my own son just about six years ago. I was driving down Highland Avenue to the church and in, a, and in a private moment, I was allowing myself to enjoy the new reality of my early pregnancy. Like Zechariah and Elizabeth, I was in awe that I would have the privilege of parenthood. I was and am older too. My son, an answer to prayer. I sang him a lullaby that my mother had sung to me decades ago, a song of wonder at his life, a song of promise that I would be with him and love him and watch over him. I cried as I sang, thankful for that really long light at the corner of Highland and East Liberty Boulevard. Now, I've not been able to find that song on Google either. But my mother wrote it on a watercolor painting that she made for me and gave to me at my shower, a painting of a rocking chair that looked like the one she bought me when my son was born. My song that day was a song of hope and joy and wonder at the surprising new way that God was showing up in my life and through my life. I was singing a song that was claiming a new call that had been placed upon me and my commitment to doing my best to live into that call. My song was also an act of courage. I sang it only alone in a car at a busy intersection because I was too early along in my pregnancy to even let many others know. 
that my song was ushering in a new thing. We, too, sing our faith. We, too, give voice to the amazing work of God upon us and through us in surprising, disrupting, and exciting ways. So siblings, what is your song? How are you giving voice to the new thing that God is upending in your life? Or giving you hope, or how God is manifesting justice through you, or upon you, or, or calling you out, or lifting you up? How is your voice proclaiming a word of praise to a God who is with us now, inviting us forward by faith? Let us sing out, siblings. Let us sing songs of social change, of spiritual renewal, of hope and courage, of justice and peace, of new life and love. For we worship a God who offers us all that and more and calls us to be Christ's body, extending this good news to all. May we sing out, siblings. May we sing out in faith and hope and love, for God is with us now. God is going before us. God is offering us and our world new and abundant life. Together, let us say thanks be to God. Amen.